God, thank you for this incredible power that you displayed in the cross, absolute omnipotence as you took on the sins of all you would save, God, so that you might thoroughly forgive them. God, thank you as we reflect now on what you did. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 32. There's some men coming by with Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put one in your hand so that you can see what we're going to say in the next few moments, Psalm 32. And if you don't own a Bible, feel free to keep this one as our gift to you. Every week at Grace Bible Church, we participate in the Lord's Table, Communion. And we like to do this every week because it reminds us it's an opportunity to remember what Jesus accomplished in his cross, in the gospel for those who believe him. And Jesus instructed the disciples to practice this regularly as an act of remembering and proclaiming his death until he comes again. So this is what communion is all about. We're remembering what Jesus' death accomplished on our behalf. In Psalm 32, we encounter one of the tremendous privileges afforded to believers because of Christ's death. Let's look together at Psalm 32. We'll look at the first two verses. A Psalm of David, a masco. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom Yahweh does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Here David is writing, recounting what life was like while he was living in the midst of sin. And he even goes on and describes a little bit of what life was like in verses three and four when he says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer, Selah. Life was hard for David so long as David harbored sin. God would not let his conscience rest until he finally acknowledged that sin and turned away from it. Now, having done that and writing this spirit-inspired psalm, he rejoices primarily at one thing that we see in the opening verses of the psalm. He's rejoicing at God's thorough forgiveness. Since David has confessed and turned away from sin, he is able to experience the blessing of God's complete forgiveness. This complete and comprehensive forgiveness that David received is seen in two things in these first couple verses, namely the synonyms used for David's sin, and we also see the completeness of God's forgiveness and the synonyms used for God's forgiveness. Look again at the first two verses. David uses four synonyms, four synonymous terms for his own wrongdoing. In verse 1, he mentions transgression and sin. In verse 2, he calls it iniquity and deceit. These things weren't characteristic always of David, but we do see all of these things present in snapshots of his life, namely in his sin with Bathsheba, his adultery. David, just like us, was a man who, is, who was thoroughly sinful, and David, like us, needed to be thoroughly forgiven by God. And we see God's thorough forgiveness in the terms that are associated in the first two verses with the terms that we just saw for David's sin. There are terms associated or attached to these synonyms for sin that have to do with God's forgiveness. Look again at verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, 
How blessed is a man to whom Yahweh does not impute or does not charge to the account of his iniquity and in whose spirit there is no more deceit. That is, God is not counting deceit present in the soul of that person. This passage doesn't say that the man who is blessed is the man who forgave himself or covered his own sin or doesn't count himself sinful or removes deceit from his own soul. It doesn't say any of those things. Rather, the verses are highlighting God being the one who forgives and man being the one who sins. In, in what's being pictured here, man is contributing one thing and it's sin. David brings one thing to the table and it's sin. And the only thing God brings to the table then is forgiveness. Man does all the sinning by himself and God does all the forgiving by himself. And so David here in poetic fashion emphatically calls the one whose soul is counted clear of that sinning, not that he hasn't sinned, but that God chooses graciously not to count that sin against him. He calls that man blessed. The only way that God could be just Christian and still justify you the only way that God could be a good judge and not punish you personally for your sin, Christian, was by providing a sinless substitute in Jesus Christ. That is the only way sin is removed from a person. When Jesus died as the one who only deserved blessing from God, as we just sung, he was bearing the sins of all those who would believe on himself. And so when God poured out his punishment, his wrath on Jesus 2,000 years ago for everybody throughout human history whom he would save, from righteous men like Enoch and Noah and Abraham and David and Solomon and so on, all the way to future believers today, 2,000 years later, when he poured out his wrath against the sins of all of those people, every sinful word, thought, deed, attitude, that left the souls of those people who turned to him in faith with nothing else to be punished for. That is the good news of the gospel. If you believe that message, if you are not counting in anything else besides that to save you so that you would be counted righteous before God, then we invite you whether you're a member of Grace Bible or just a regular visitor, to take communion with us. You can rejoice in God's thorough forgiveness through Christ. Those of us who are here who do not believe that, if you're here and do not believe that the only way for you to be counted righteous before God is through having your sins forgiven on Christ. If you look at these synonyms that David used for himself and think, I'm not that bad, then communion is not actually for you yet. You must believe what God says about Christ, that he didn't come to save the righteous but sinners. And so if you count yourself righteous in any way before God on your own merit, then you have not yet believed the gospel. And yet you can you can believe the gospel. If you are in persisting in rebellion against God, then this is a great moment for you that you're here, whether you want to be here or not, because you have an opportunity now to believe what God is saying about your own state before him and turn to him in faith. And so in a moment, the men are going to come by and pass out a cup of juice, a little cracker, they don't do anything when you take them in and of themselves, but there are reminders of this truth that we have just discovered, just seen again in Psalm 32, that God forgives thoroughly those who are thoroughly sinful. So I'm going to ask the men to come forward and serve us, and you can take communion on your own when you're ready, and I'll be back up to pray. <clears throat>